Welcome to the OR Today webinar series. We are excited to have over 50 registered attendees for today's webinar. Some housekeeping notes before we begin. The second annual OR Today Live Surgical Conference will be held August 28th through the 30th in Chicago, Illinois. All of our educational sessions presented at OR Today Live are approved for continuing education credit. In total, over 22 CE contact hours are being offered at this year's conference. Learn more at ortodaylive.com. Next, we will award an OR Today Live Doc Kit to the first attendee who can answer the following question. Which city will host the 2020 Summer Olympics? Use the questions feature on your webinar dashboard to answer now. That question again, which city will host the 2020 Summer Olympics? While you are answering, I want to remind you today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education credit. To obtain your certificate, you must complete the post-webinar survey, which will appear immediately on your computer screen at the end of today's call. If you do not receive the survey, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. All right, and the winner of our OR Today Live Doc Kit is Jana Peary. Congratulations, Jana. The correct answer is Tokyo. Registration is open for the OR Today Live Surgical Conference, and the early bird discount still applies. Once again, you can find more information at ortodaylive.com. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, Census Technologies. Census Technologies is the leader in surgical asset management software, offering solutions that advance efficiency, transparency, and regulatory compliance. SensiTrack, the flagship product in the portfolio, is a comprehensive solution that interfaces with existing clinical systems and equipment, creating a patient-centric perioperative model focused on maximizing OR thoroughput while increasing patient safety. Learn more about this company by visiting census.com. Our presenter today is Jennifer Zola, RN, BSN. Jennifer is a sales consultant for Census Technologies with over 20 years of healthcare experience in a variety of hospital settings. Jennifer, you may begin whenever you are ready. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone and thank you for taking the time to join us. My name is Jennifer Zola and our topic today is the truth about surgical asset management automation. Can it really help the OR? And we came up with this topic based on following some conversations on OR Today's OR Nation's Listserv, which is a great online place to see what your peers are talking about. But we, we've seen many questions and comments in the conversation streams about how to improve tray configurations, tray accuracy, or just processes in SPD that impact the OR. Some of the issues posted, we know um, instrument management automation can directly impact. But because these systems are typically thought of as a tool mainly for sterile processing, we thought a discussion around what automation means for the OR specifically could be helpful. So here we go. On our agenda today, I will start with a very brief overview of census. I didn't realize we were going to get that in the beginning, so I'll cut it even shorter than I planned, but I promise. <laughs> then um, talk about the goals of reprocessing and some of the challenges associating with, associated with building trays accurately. Um, next, we'll discuss a few reasons facilities have moved to instrument management automation and then how automation impacts the OR. And then finally, we'll go over some tips if you're planning to transition away from manual processes, as well as things to look for in a partner, and then finish with questions. So who is Census? Um, Census Technologies is actually our corporate name, and Census is our flagship product. Although today, I believe most people know it's a Census we were the first company to track surgical assets at the instrument level. It's our number one focus. And because our portfolio of products revolves around sterile processing, we are frequent, 
frequently engaged with uh, SPD staff, but in reality our solutions impact both sterile processing and the OR, so I am excited to share some of the benefits of instrument automation today with, with all of you. Um, we're the leader in our space. We do have over 470 customers, including corporate partners like Universal Health Services, IDNs like Ascension Health, and the VA hospitals, uh, to name a few. Census specializes in making sure our clients have the right instruments in the right place at the right time. And additionally, we want to make sure that those assets are in proper working condition so that regulatory requirements and patient safety measures are met while throughput to the OR is streamlined. So before digging into our topic today, let's just take a high-level look at goals of instrument reprocessing from the OR's perspective. And after reviewing some of the questions and comments from OR Today followers, the majority of issues related to surgical trays seem to tie to these four goals. Um, they include number one, on-time delivery to the OR, number two, making sure trays have the right assets in them and are arranged properly, number three, giving visibility to all parties that have a stake in making sure things arrive to the OR on time, and then lastly, number four, the need for processes to be in line with regulatory requirements, including any necessary documentation. So on-time delivery challenges. Let's uh, start there. The first possible challenge is related to not having enough wiggle room and in inventory levels. If you're counting on a set used in the morning to get reprocessed in time for an afternoon case, that can set things up for possible delays. It's not unusual actually for facilities to find themselves on occasion uh, in a position where they have to make same-day inventory turns to accommodate case loads. But in that scenario, those sets need to get through the reprocessing loop as quickly as possible. Another challenge is related to expectations around how fast things can be reprocessed. So reprocessing sterilization times, they can vary from 4 to 40 minutes. And on certain items, the go-to shortcut, uh, immediate use steam sterilization, is not an option based on manufacturer's instructions for use. So when evaluating root causes of instruments not getting to the OR on time, it's always important to be aware that not all assets are created equal, meaning that they're not all reprocessed in the same way. Also, if the sterile uh, processing department does not have a way to differentiate between which trays coming through decontam should be reprocessed first based on you know, where they are on the schedule, any set needing around is, is so hard to flag. I mean, if you walk through decontam, you can imagine what that's like to pick, like a needle, picking a needle out of a haystack. So in a manual environment, typically the goal is just to get everything done as quickly as possible because there's really no way to be strategic when choosing what to process first. Oh, my, there it goes. Sorry, it's not advancing very quickly. Another challenge is related to the fact that today's sets are getting larger and more complex. So sorting through a basket of instruments like you see here, coming out of washers and then organizing them accurately by using a paper checklist, that takes, that takes some time. Then there are issues related to sterilization. If, uh, if sets are rushed through the cooling process, you can get wet packs. Also sterilizer loads occasionally fail or a biological indicator test may fail. And that means all the items in that sterilizer load have to be re-sterilized. <clears throat> Another source of delay in getting things to the OR can simply be locating assets in storage and then building case carts manually. There can be rows and rows of shelves to navigate when collecting assets needed for a case, you know, and you're just using a paper list. So especially for new staff, the time it takes to build case carts accurately can vary depending on the tech's knowledge of inventory locations. 
And then for sets that contain implants, regulatory guidelines recommend that a biological indicator test should be included in the sterilization load. And until that specific BI test has completed the incubation period and has been read, the tray with the implant on board really has to stay in, in quarantine. You can't rush through that step. Other factors that impact reprocessing efficiency include the time it takes to physically write down in a log everything that you're putting into that sterilization load, and then the time it takes for the load to cool properly after the sterilization cycle is complete. And then again, if you rush the cool time, you can end up with wet packs, and that means the sterilization process is going to have to be repeated. Loaner sets or um, vendor trays, they have their own set of challenges. First of all, they must go through reprocessing at the facility. Even if they arrive neatly wrapped and looking ready for the OR, the facility has no way of knowing under what conditions the assets were transported, if proper sterilization processes were followed, and so on. Ultimately, the facility is responsible for ensuring the sterile integrity of the tray or set, and so the facility has to put it through their own reprocessing loop. It is really important for vendors to deliver sets well in advance of a case, so sterile processing has a sufficient lead time to follow their, you know, the, their procedures. Also, many loaner sets today have multiple trays. You try to keep everything organized. Stacking these trays together can lead to torn wrap, which again, that leads to the need for re-sterilization. And if a loaner set has an implant, regulatory guidelines recommend against immediate use steam sterilization. So if you think about it, unlike surgical instruments, implants by definition are going to be left in the patient. And so to protect against surgical site infections, implants are their sterilization standard, and facilities do want to adhere to the recommendation to avoid um, immediate use steam sterilization and run it through the proper reprocessing. In terms of tray accuracy, in today's sterile processing departments, just like in the OR, there are so many instruments that staff and technicians have to be familiar with. And when they come into decontam and through the wash area in a jumbled mess, it takes time to sort everything out. Also, you know, keep in mind that instruments tend to migrate as they come from the OR through decontam. So finding which instruments belong to another tray or which instruments are missing from a set, I mean, that's all very time consuming. There are some regulatory trends that also impact sterile processing time. So the FDA, for example, recently in 2015 issued a safety communication about the need to keep the manufacturer instructions for use available to techs while they're performing reprocessing. In this case, it was specifically tied to scopes. But the expectation to have IFUs readily available to techs in sterile processing in general that's not new. This recent communication just sort of underscored the importance in the scope reprocessing area. And when you think about it, it takes time for technicians to manually look up and find the particular manufacturer IFUs needed for the assets they're working on if everything's in paper and in binders. Also in 2015, the CDC and FDA jointly sent out a, rec a recommended guidelines about the importance of maintaining up-to-date documentation related to staff competencies in the reprocessing area. And there's multiple competencies that they have to keep track of on each individual employee. So staff should not be performing reprocessing tasks that they are not currently certified to do. So having the right staff with the right training in place in the sterile processing department is definitely important to uh, keep things moving efficiently through the reprocessing loop. And then there's the FDA's unique device identifier initiative. And there is a lot of uncertainty in the industry around UDI. So I wanted to spend just a few minutes reviewing how the new UDI system will impact facilities. 
First of all, what is UDI? Uh, the UDI initiative is a global plan and involves not just the FDA, but also the European Commission and, and other regulatory agencies internationally. It's proposed legislation that impacts reusable surgical instruments, and it involves the establishment of a universal database, which the acronym for that database is Good ID. It's, you know, stands for Global Unique Device Identification Database. The final rule was posted in 2013 and initially impacted, it impacts device manufacturers and labelers right now. The reason behind UDI is to create a system that provides a better way to handle recalls and the reporting of adverse patient events. So here's a scenario published in the FDA's unique device literature to help illustrate how the UDI system will benefit patients as well as healthcare providers. So patient Woody Smith needs a knee replacement, and prior to his surgery, Woody or meets with his surgeon and he learns about his implant along with the device identifier from his surgeon. And using the device identifier, Woody can research his implant through the good ID or the, the global database. And on the day of surgery, the UDI of the implant components are going to be scanned and added to Woody's electronic health record. And the UDI system will also, in theory, electronically send the facility's supply chain and billing systems information to help streamline getting claims over to the payer. <clears throat> Then after discharge, Woody can easily report any adverse events that he experiences. He can look at the global database to clarify questions and make comments. But most importantly, if there's ever a recall or a safety alert, he can quickly uh, grab that information through the use of his uh, unique device identifier. To date, the bulk of the published regulations apply to stage one out of the four stages represented here on this slide, and they mainly those um, changes apply to manufacturers and labelers. It requires new assets from manufacturers to have specific label requirements and devices to have permanent marks in a specific format uh, by specific dates moving forward. The next step after everything is marked is for electronic health records and other applications such as tracking systems to incorporate UDI data capture into their software solutions so that eventually hospitals will need to invest in systems that leverage that UDI information in order to get us to level four where our patient Woody was able to keep track of information related to his implant. So the first set of compliance dates um, affected class three devices. Class one devices, which includes the majority of reusable surgical instruments, will need to be marked by September of 2020. So by that date, new surgical instruments must bear a UDI as a permanent mark on the device itself if that device is, is intended to be used more than once or if it's intended to be reprocessed before each use. So unlike the first two regulatory trends I mentioned, the UDI initiative may actually help to speed up aspects of reprocessing because of having barcodes directly on instruments, and we'll talk about that later in the presentation. Also, if you'd like more information on UDI, we've included a fact sheet on UDI that includes compliance dates for manufacturers and labelers in the presentation workbook. Because of all these challenges we just went over and maybe other possible concerns facilities are having, many facilities are thinking about instrument automation, but in a lot of cases it, it's on the back burner. In order to decide if automation is worth the investment, it's going to be important to understand where it can make an impact. In, in other words, is there a sound return on investment, or will moving to automation help fulfill some required needs? And every facility is different, so reasons to consider automation at one hospital differ from reasons that are driving another hospital to move away from manual processes. 
So I've organized my information on how automation impacts the OR based on the path an instrument follows to get to the OR. So I wanted to review the reprocessing loop. So assets will say they're starting in decontam here, where they're going to be washed and uh, uh, scrubbed and sent over to the assembly area, also called prep and pack, where technicians are going to configure and organize them into trays according to instructions. After that, those trays are going to go and go through the sterilization process. And after they've cooled, um, they're going to go into storage where uh, case carts may be assembled and then move on up to the OR. So it's a fairly straightforward loop, but um, there's a lot of things, a lot of points to this loop where assets may enter or exit. For example, vendor trays have to come in through decontam and start through that loop. Um, you can, in, in addition to assets coming back from the OR, things may be coming back from outside clinics. In the assembly area, things may be going out to repair. And then in the storage, in addition to stocking the OR, they may be sending things over to um, outpatient surgery centers or clinics. So there's a lot of moving pieces and parts to keep track of. So let's start in decontam. In this area, the key benefit of automation is the ability to interface your OR scheduler system to the instrument management system so users can see which trays need to be expedited. This is huge. So in this example, the trays in red are stat, meaning they require special handling to get to the OR in time. The trays in yellow need to be processed as soon as possible. And anything that's not highlighted can be processed in a normal sequence or normal manner. Giving technicians the ability to see which trays to begin processing first, that's critical to moving trays through the loop efficiently. OK, loaner sets, they also enter the reprocessing loop in decontam. A lot of times, loaner sets just show up in sterile processing without much notice. Uh, but before the case needing a loaner gets scheduled, there are some steps that can be captured through automation. So in, um, if the doctor is getting ready to schedule uh, a case on a particular patient and that he needs a loaner set for, he's going to contact the vendor. The vendor is then going to let the doctor know what dates those trays are available. And then the doctor's office is going to contact surgery or the hospital and schedule the case. The assets are going to get dropped off by the vendor, hopefully with plenty of lead time for reprocessing to take place. And then those assets are going to go through the reprocessing loop and be sent to the OR. Then after OR, they'll get reprocessed again, actually, so that the, they are ready to be picked up by the vendor. And the ability to capture all this information on the front end, that helps the central sterile supply department prepare by um, having proper instructions for use on hand. That's a requirement that they ha anything they're reprocessing, you know, they have to have their IFUs available. And it also makes sure, allows them to ensure they have staff with the proper training there to actually reprocess those assets. Automation also helps hospitals hold vendors accountable for dropping things off on time. You know, most uh, policies say they need to be dropped off 48 hours in advance. And if you've got a vendor that's chronically dropping things off late so that the sterile processing department has to rush, um, having data with timestamps and being able to show a track record to the vendor, that sometimes arms the facility with the right information to change that vendor's behavior. And then the other benefit of having automation in terms of loaner sets is it does allow, and we're going to go through this in a little bit, the OR to see tray status. So if you know you've got cases coming up, you can see where things are in the loop. So let's move on to the assembly area, often called prep and pack. This is where automation makes a big impact on tray accuracy and it helps to expedite reprocessing time as well. So just like in decontam with an interface to the OR scheduler, 
technicians assembling trays that can see which ones to assemble first. Then instead of paper count sheets, they will have electronic sheets displayed in front of them when they scan the tray that will include pictures of what each asset looks like. They can easily toggle over to manufacturer IFUs instead of searching for them through binders. They can see facility approved substitutions if an item is missing. Um, they can see which items are critical to be present in order for the tray to be allowed to move on to the sterilization phase. And then with uh, the unique device identification initiative, and once instruments are marked, instead of manually checking off tray components, technicians can simply scan the item, and then this lets the system alert the tech if an item is incorrect, missing, or needs to be pulled out because it's uh, due for maintenance. So without a surgical asset management solution, imagine using this paper checklist to sort through this basket of instruments that needs to be assembled. This type of manual process is what leads to issues like this one described in a recent OR Nation listserv user comment. I'm just going to read the quote. I have a question about how trays are put together in sterile processing. The biggest concern I have is that we've been losing a lot of instruments lately. I suggested that they, the SPD, have the person putting the tray together sign the sheet and a designated lead person sign off before the tray is wrapped. How do the larger facilities do it? We are a 581-bed hospital with 14 OR suites. So with automation, it helps assure tray accuracy without the need for a second person to check another person's work. And what a technician simply scans the tray barcode, and that brings up not only the count sheet electronically here, but also it shows what the tray should look like when it's assembled. Um, these camera icons over here are ways that you can go see what, if you're unfamiliar with an instrument, just click right over there and see what it looks like. You can toggle over to any needed information to help with that assembly. You can view substitutes, go to the one source database, or any other instructions that the facility wants to add are, you know, available. And then if instruments are marked with a barcode, let me show you what that process looks like if the technician starts scanning instruments. So if an asset is due for maintenance um, based on the number of times it's gone through the reprocessing loop, while they're scanning through those uh, uh, instruments, they would get an alert like this, something that says it's past due for maintenance. If an item got mixed into the basket of instruments when scanned, uh, the technician would get this type of message, something indicating it doesn't belong. And then if at the completion of assembly an item is missing, this type of information will be displayed when the technician attempts to say that they're done with the tray. So if the items missing are non-critical, the technician still can go ahead and send the tray on and print a label to put on the wrapper that says it's missing something, but they're going to get a reminder saying, you know, we don't have everything yet. So it's really you can imagine this is a much more efficient way to try to build an accurate tray than with that paper list and trying to stack things and sort them out on, your ta on the table in front of you. Okay, moving into the sterilization stage, automation helps keep, help keep things moving efficiently by uh, capturing important documentation electronically and instead of the technician having to write down what's going into their sterilizer load and what the results of the load are, that's all captured. And then with an interface between the sterilizer and the tracking system, even these tapes from the sterilizer, those can be captured automatically instead of having to file them in notebooks and then store them for future reference. There it goes. Sorry, it's slow on some of these slides. Now, we talked about how searching for assets and using paper checklists is time-consuming, 
And with scanning technology, asset locations can be quickly determined if the user is not sure of where an asset is stocked just by looking in the system. And instead of manually checking an asset off a paper list, scanning the assets using an electronic pick list when building a case cart ensures that no assets are going to get missed and everything sent to the OR is accurately documented. I mentioned as one of the goals of reprocess, reprocessing that we want both sterile processing and OR staff to be able to see where assets are and what stage of reprocessing they're in. And automation allows this to happen. So I realize this is kind of hard to read here, but um, it's a color-coded list of which cases on this day have assets ready for an on-time start, and then which ones have assets somewhere in the reprocessing loop. So instead of making phone calls and interrupting workflow with a tracking system, the OR staff can see where the day's potential snags are and can use that information to make adjustments or intervene to make sure everyone's working on the highest priority. Another benefit of automation related to transparency between departments is the ability to document quality issues and feedback in the instrument management system, including pictures of, of issues that come up. So reporting quality issues is not easy for everyone. Many staff members shy away from being a whistleblower and then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got employees that report issues all the time and get labeled as complainers. So having the ability to record problems when they are discovered or when a staff member has time to actually sit down and get the details right, that not only helps to encourage quality issues to be reported, but it's going to allow management the opportunity to effectively monitor and track progress. Anytime you can snap a picture also, that enhances communication because we all know pictures are worth a thousand words, truly. Analytics is another important benefit that automation brings to the table, and it can help identify patterns and trends that are slowing down reprocessing efforts. And analytics is different from basic data retrieval, and I, I do think that's an important point. The way it was explained to me by a software engineer was through this hierarchy pyramid. So here at the bottom, you're putting data in and all you're getting back out is data. You're just basically storing your information that you're capturing. If you put that information and organize it into a spreadsheet and group it, you start to learn more from your data. And then if you apply and, uh, some rules on how that data is displayed, for example, using color coding, you, you end up even being able to pull more knowledge out of your data that you scanned into the system. And then if you can combine reports or apply more complex algorithms, that's when you get to the top of the pyramid here, the wisdom level, and that's where your data provides better information for effective decision making. So the more sophisticated your reporting design, the more value you get all the, from all the data that your staff's been scanning. And combining reports and applying rules is how analytics helps department managers find those opportunities for improvement and then later validates uh, how the solutions are working out. And so here's some examples of data capture and retriever, ver, uh, retrieval versus analytics. So on the left here, we've got some uh, examples of just pure data capture. Uh, here's a report called Actual History Detail, and all you're going to get back is assembly history by container. Under Data Analytics, we've got a report Processing Priorities. So that's going to show you a current tally or percent of containers by priority level based on your OR schedule. So that's much more valuable information. Another example um, of data capture, items missing history report. That's just going to tell you instruments that were missing from previous assemblies. But a utilization and shortage report is going to show you monthly statistics by container of the percent of instruments utilized, missing, and unmarked for assembled containers. That's a lot more valuable. So true analytics is what helps managers and directors identify quality issues, department trends, and the effectiveness of process changes. So 
So a real life scenario of how data capture and analytics can impact process and procedure, I've got an example here. Recent studies suggest that a certain percentage of surgical trays in most facilities are typically overstocked. This trend, um, this tends to happen because while it's not unusual for assets to be added to tray configurations over time, rarely are assets that aren't utilized, they usually don't get pulled back out of the set configuration. So the research is showing that for surgical sets where some of the tray subsets are never touched, a facility may save significant dollars by identifying those sets, conducting a study, and then using the results to determine if there's any savings that could be achieved if those assets were pulled out, because it costs money to keep putting those assets through the reprocessing loop. The studies go on to suggest that although there's a cost associated with peel packs, in many cases making some of the rarely used assets available as peel packs rather than leaving them in the set can be more cost effective than constantly reprocessing those items. So having a tracking system to capture instrument utilization in a specific type of procedure makes a case study like this one in particular possible. And if you actually would like to have the information or look at the specific studies that I just mentioned, one of the attachments included in your workbook provides the specifics and the references. One huge benefit of instrument management system, uh, systems is all the checks and balances that are going on in the background that help drive regulatory compliance. So we already have mentioned a few examples. Of, you know, the system can uh, produce reminders that alert the staff that sterilizing a tray, that because an implant's included, the sterilizer load needs to have a biological indicator test on board. So it can give them an audible and visual alert saying, don't forget to add a biological test. Or if a technician's competency is not current, the software logic uh, blocks them from completing tasks associated with that competency in the system. So that's going to help support regulatory compliance as well. One item that we have not mentioned is the capability of alerting the OR staff if an asset makes it to the OR without having been through the proper reprocessing stages, meaning decontam, assembly, sterilization. Um, so basically, if it hasn't gone through these steps, as soon as that tray is scanned, uh, the alert comes up, letting the nurse know to return that asset to decontam right away. So here we are back at our list of reprocessing goals. Um, does instrument management automation help the OR? That's our first goal, the on-time delivery to the OR. And I hope I was able to convey that all the efficiencies that instrument tracking automation provides to the SPD in the end are what help to maximize asset throughput to the OR. Number two, tray accuracy. The software actually functions as a chaperone to guide tray assembly without having to pull out paper count sheets and technicians memorize every instrument or use flashcards to help ensure accurate tray assembly. Number three, uh, tray status location and accuracy. By capturing each step of the reprocessing loop through scanning, OR has visibility to important information that impacts their activities. And then number four, automation helps drive regulatory compliance behind the scenes with checks and balances, paperless record keeping, and alerts to technicians. There are a few interesting st statistics supporting how automation can impact not just the SPD but the OR as well. So facilities that have automation in place report up to a 30% reduction in OR time spent looking for assets. I mean, once you have, you've scanned everything to, as you move it through the loop, it's easy to go in if you're looking for something and find the closest location where you can go and retrieve it. Up to a 20% reduction in OR case delays due to tray availability because now we're moving things through the loop efficiently and we're prioritizing which trays need to get to the OR 
and be worked on first up to a 50% reduction in lost or missing items, and that's simply because of all the scanning that's going on. It's easy to look in the system, and if something's missing, and see the last location where it was scanned and backtrack to that point. And then because we're moving things through the loop um, and ensuring that every step and process gets checked off before it reaches the OR, we see up to a 10% reduction in surgical site infections. If you're considering automation, here are a few suggestions. So develop a return on investment. And instrument tracking and management software is not new. There's over a decade of information out there, and there's outcome data available. So there are resources that can help you determine a return on investment. Typically, that your solution vendor can help you with this. And once you complete that, sharing the results with the staff helps to engage them in a positive way and help them prepare for the transition. That ROI, also the, the results, can help with budget justification and approval. And then you want to think about where you're going to want scan points. Of course, you're going to this is going to be helpful for hardware budgeting and making sure you're um, requesting the right amount of funding. But of course, you need the key scan points, decontam, you know, assembly, prep and pack, storage, etc. But there are other areas where you may want to capture information. So do you want to scan assets into cases and validate you know, not just what was delivered to the OR, but what was used in a case? Do you want OR to validate of a separate where you want things scanned in there. So kind of think through where your scan points are, and that will help you determine your hardware uh, cost. And then a big thing is to convert your count sheet data to an electronic format like Excel or Word. If it's not already in one of those formats, if it's just paper forms, your vendor is going to be responsible for converting your data to their system format and importing the data into the system. But you have to get the data to the vendor. And you can work on converting sheets to electronic format while you're even in the budgeting process. It can cost time and money to implement one solution and then change to another. And the reprocessing, er reprocessing area is a highly regulated area, which means things change frequently as well. So you want to choose a company that is prepared to adapt and change it uh, as the industry changes. And in addition to making sure the solution meets your needs, it's important to investigate the company's commitment to the software solution. And I've got some questions here to consider asking. So what percentage or how many of the company's employees are dedicated to support? Because once that goes live, you're going to need 20, you know, someone available 24 hours if something's not working right. How many product releases and updates does a company average per year? That's going to tell you if, they're, if this um, a solution is really one of their flagship products that they stay on top of. What is the company's retention rate specific to instrument management software? Um, are their customers sticking with them over the years? And I love this last question, does the company have a user group dedicated to the instrument management um, space? And the reason, this question can be very telling even if you don't plan to attend a user group meeting. Because when a company makes the investment to plan and organize a meeting and engage speakers for their user group, it's usually a good indicator of whether or not they listen to their customers and make sure their solutions meet the changing industry needs. No vendor wants to stand in front of their customer base every year and face questions and comments if their products aren't keeping up with customer expectations. So it's a great question to put on an RFP. All right, so I hope this information has been helpful and informative in some way in your role. Um, surgical asset management systems, although they're targeted for SPD, they definitely have benefits for the OR. Um, the improved transparency alone between central sterile and OR improves communication and helps promote a more collaborative team environment between the two areas. And I hope that came through today. I would love your feedback and comments. 
please don't be shy in letting me know if you need additional information or clarifications. And then I wanted to also thank OR Today for providing this forum to connect uh, solution providers like Sensatrack with healthcare providers in a way that helps us all. It's really sometimes hard to connect in today's busy healthcare world. So with that, are there any questions? Yes, there are, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, how long does it take a facility to put barcodes on their instruments? So that would be your existing inventory that you're wanting to if you're wanting to market. Um, there, you you can mark your own instruments, and some facilities take you know a year or months, and and have certain people that work on it when they have some downtime and sterile processing. And then you can hire a service. Um, typically, when the services come in to mark your instruments, um, they're going to not get everything. They're going to, they'll start and make a lot of progress the first week. And then as assets are going through the loop and they're trying to get to them, the ones that aren't marked, it slows down a little bit. But usually in about a month's time to, to two months or six weeks, they can get 60% of instruments marked. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. We'd just like to take this opportunity to remind attendees that they can still submit questions um, using the question feature on your dashboard. Um, the next question is, what is an average time frame for implementing a system? Um, so that varies, too, on the facility. Um, you know, the biggest uh, slowdown in getting something implemented, I mean, typically, I would say in a couple of months you can get your system up and running. But the biggest thing is getting the electronic, uh, the count sheets into electronic format because the vendor is going to count on the facility to get that work done if they're not already in a format. And so if that's not done on the front end, that can delay when they, the implementation teams can come in and really um, start you know, building the database, get it all imported and set up, and then come on site to do the training. So, um, but I would say anywhere from uh, two to four months is probably the average time to implement a system. And, you know, there's a lot of conference calls and um, we have e-books on what's involved in implementation and, and different things to help um, try, try to walk people through that process and make sure they're comfortable with, you know, who's got to do what and who, what things are done together with the vendor. Okay. When do you anticipate FDA will require hospitals to document which instruments were used in each patient case? So that's a little vague right now. Um, you know, we have a marking solution and we love to know that day because we love to promote it. But to be perfectly honest, it's not clear, you know, when that's going to happen. We know when instruments have to be marked, new instruments. Um, we don't know if you have to mark your old ones. It's just the reason to mark your old ones is that if you're going to be scanning your new ones, it's, it's just easier and better for technicians to be able to scan them once they're marked. It makes everything run more efficiently. But UDI is still unfolding. And so right now, there's a lot of uh, information out there if you're a manufacturer or a labeler. But if you're a hospital, you know, it's, it's still we're waiting for more guidance and we are always trying to stay on top of it. If we see stuff, we always post it in our blog, <laughs> any new information, but it, it's just not clear yet. Okay, thank you. And the last question is, you mentioned substitution of items. Does the manufacturer, like Smith & Nephew, have a list of substitutes for you? Uh, we have our, for Sensatrack, our implementation team has access to see in our large database of 40 to 50,000 instruments what some acceptable substitutes are. But part of implementation, they're going to find out what inventory you have at your facility and they're going to help set that up in the system of what's an acceptable substitute, you know, at your particular facility. 
Okay, thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you again to today's sponsors, Census Technologies. One lucky attendee today will win lunch for their department. Details are included in the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. You must complete the survey to obtain your certificate. If you do not see the survey, then email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com.